All right, welcome everyone. Um, I am Diane Dahoney. I am the Community Service Librarian at the Paul Sawyer Public Library. And uh, on behalf of the library, I just wanna welcome you tonight. Thanks so much for, for joining us. It's a, a, a pretty evening out there, but we're so glad that you um, chose to participate tonight in what I know is going to be an informative and entertaining presentation. Um, as you may know, our summer reading program this year at Paul Sawyer is called Hometown Adventures. So we know that uh, people are only starting to kind of get back out and um, uh, we know that not everyone is, is doing a lot of uh, distance traveling this summer, but there's so many wonderful things that are right here just in our backyard in Frankfurt. There are so many treasures and a lot of folks that are a lot of folks aren't aware of. So we wanted to highlight some of those things um, with our summer reading program this this year. So today um, I have the distinct honor of um, <clears throat> introducing Kate Hesseldens and Vicki Middlesworth from Liberty Hall Historic <laughs> Site. Hello, hello, ladies. She's here. Um, we're so glad that you are with us. They are going to be presenting a program called A Frankfurt Treasure, the Liberty Hall Library and Archives. And they will be talking about the Senator John Brown Library and Archives, um, which is on site downtown in downtown Frankfurt at the Liberty Hall um, Historic Site. And uh, speaking of treasures, they truly have just a wonderful collection. And I think there's a lot of things that they have in their collection that you're gonna be surprised by and maybe you weren't aware of. Um, so they're gonna give you a little bit, a little taste of that tonight. And then hopefully um, maybe you can get out and go visit them um, uh, this summer and take a look for yourself. But um, without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Kate Hesseldens. Thanks, Kate. Thank you, Diane. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen here. Get this going. Okay, so yes, thank you to the Paul Sawyer Public Library for having Vicki and I, and, um, and thanks to you guys for tuning in. Um, as she said, we're gonna talk about the library here. And um, so everything pretty much in the PowerPoint, um, un unless otherwise noted is, is in our collection. So it's owned by us. So a lot of you guys probably already know this, but I'm gonna just briefly introduce Liberty Hall Historic Site and the Brown family. Um, Liberty Hall is a Georgian mansion built by John Brown. Of course, he was one of Kentucky's first US senators and he began um, building Liberty Hall in 1796. It wasn't finished though until 1804. Um, and look, can you see this side thing? Uh, hopefully you can see this, I put this on the side, but anyway, um, John Brown was born in Virginia. He came to Kentucky when it was still part of Virginia, and he settled in Danville in 1783. Um, he was a lawyer, um, began representing the District of Kentucky um, in the Virginia legislature pretty early. Um, he held that position until 1788. Then he went on to represent Kentucky in the U.S. House of Representatives, and then when Kentucky became a state in 1792, um, the newly formed legislature elected him as one of the first U.S. senators. And he served in that capacity for like three terms until 1805. And then his wife there on the left, Margareta Mason, she grew up in New York City. She married John in 1799. He was 41 and she was 26 when they married. And a lot of people think she looks like she's 13 in that portrait, but she was actually a little older than that. Um, and she moved to Kentucky in 1801. So these are just some pictures of uh, the site. It's bound by the Kentucky River on the western side of the property. Uh, John Brown built a very grand home. Here are some shots of the interiors, the parlor and the dining room. Some of the workspaces in the back of the house, the kitchen and the laundry that we've recently, somewhat recently, um, reinterpreted. The Browns owned slaves. They enslaved at least 15 people who lived at Liberty Hall. Um, and among them were the Stepney family. Miles and Hannah Stepney, and then you can see their children listed there. There's eight children. And then other uh, people that were enslaved by the Browns that lived at Liberty Hall were two women named Fanny, a Frankie, Harriet, and a Henry. Um, so it's just good to mention that that those opulent rooms, um, you know, were kept up by uh, the people that they did enslave. 
And also we have the Orlando Brown House. Um, that's the second house on the property, built in 1835. Um, the Browns had two sons that survived to adulthood. Mason would inherit Liberty Hall and split up the, to split up the inheritance, they built the other home, the Orlando Brown House for um, their second son. And um, Mason became a lawyer and a judge. And then Orlando, he went through a few different career choices, but he ended up being the editor of a local newspaper, the Frankfurt Commonwealth. And the last family member, I was gonna use my little laser pointer here. Um, the last family member to live at Liberty Hall was this woman here, Mary Mason Scott in the white dress. And she died in 1934. Um, the Liberty Hall became a museum in 1937. The last family member to live at the Orlando Brown House was this woman um, here, Annie Hoard Brown. She died in 1955, and the home was left to the National Society of Colonial Dames in Kentucky, um, who still own the property, and they own both houses, actually. So that's just a little background about Liberty Hall. I'm going to talk about the Library and Archives project that we completed a few years back to open it. Um, so in 2014, we received a, a two-year grant from the Kentucky Bar Foundation, which was our neighbor right there on Wilkinson Street, to catalog the collection. Um, and the library is actually housed in what used to be, would have been a bedchamber in the time of John and Margareta's time. Um, and at some point they moved, and I think it was in the 60s, they installed these bookcases into this bedchamber and, and put the books there. This is on the second floor of Liberty Hall. And if you do go on a public tour, you'll get to see this library. Um, and when I started here in 2012, this is what it looked like. Um, the, so the first floor had gone through this big restoration and this actually just became like a storage area. So you can see there's paintings there. There was all kinds of stuff that we had to go through to just move a lot of stuff around. So, but it was, it was a lot of organizing. Um, but after we got the grant, we did, um, we did do a lot. We had to take all those books down, as you can see. Um, but we fixed the windows, we did, we painted, there was a lot of work done, we got blinds on these windows. Um, we also hired part time archivists. Um, so we had um, a few different people and we had interns as well. So we were able to catalog all of our books, finish our photographs and inventory our archives. And we had so many books that my dad actually <clears throat> built this um, island shelf in the, in the middle of the room, just because we needed to house them all. We just didn't have enough room on the white bookshelves. Uh, let's see here. So our library contains over 2,500 volumes, 350 manuscripts, and 1,000 photographs. Um, and many of these books belong to Brown family members. So we know that John and Mar Margareta and successive generations really viewed books as valuable possessions. And both of them had a, seemed to have a lifelong interest in, in education and knowledge. And um, 200, I'll just go back real quick, 230 books. Um, these books here were owned by, they have the name of John or Margareta in them. So that's really neat. And then on the other side of this <laughs> island shelf, there's uh, it's 93 books that were owned by the two sons. So um, the bulk of the collection really is literature. It's mostly English. Um, there's several poetry books, fiction, plays. There's 50 books that are just Shakespeare collections. And then the second most um, common topic is religion. And there are about 60 books that are either Bibles or related to the Bible. Um, there's also works in religious histories and other commentators. And this quote that if you can see this says, um, let wise men and good books be your constant companion. And John wrote that to his son, Orlando. So we know that that was a family interest in, in good books. So the oldest book in the library is from 1680. It's a French book. And I'm not going to try to say that, but what it means, it's, uh, translates to is remarks on the state of the United Provinces of the lower country, the Netherlands in the year 1672. So we have about 270 books, French books in the collection, and many were signed by this guy right here, Savary. And uh, so we, I looked this up uh, to figure out who he was. He was a native of France. He came to America in 1783. He ended up settling in Millersburg, Kentucky, and he represented Bourbon County in the state legislature. Um, he died in 1814, and I don't know why we have all these books of his, but I think maybe John Brown either, maybe he bought them or wrote, maybe after he, the man died or 
Um, it's possible they were given into him. But we know the family, especially Margareta, had an interest in French culture. So, you know, she spoke and read French, so maybe he got them for her. We're not sure. Um, so during John Brown's 20-year political career as a representative of the District of, Dis the District of Kentucky and later as the U.S. Senator, um, he really represented his constituents' concerns regarding the West. Um, and as Kentucky was considered the West in those years, um, as you can see, this is actually from our library. It's an atlas from 1804. Um, and Kentucky is, you know, right on the edge of the country there. Um, and so this is a really cool atlas. And we have, actually, we have two copies of the same atlas, but one was owned by John Brown. Um, so early in his career, Kentuckians wanted statehood, and um, he helped to obtain that. So there are two items that kind of point to his involvement in helping with that. And first is this letter from John Brown to his brother James. Um, and this letter describes a private meeting John Brown had with President George Washington and then Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson. And the discussion centered on the issue of free navigation of the Mississippi River then controlled by Spain. And this was one of the main reasons Kentuckians wanted statehood. They wanted to be able to trade their goods up down river. So I'm just going to read this. It says, the, this is just an excerpt from this letter. The president considers this a favorable moment to urge our claim to the right of navigating the Mississippi and has in the most explicit terms declared his determination to take the most effectual measures for obtaining that important object and for, and for perpetuating the union between this and the Western country. Should the plan proposed succeed, the result must prove highly satisfactory to the Western people. And it was actually at Washington's recommendation that the first Congress accepted Kentucky's statehood petition. And there had been very many, several previous petitions. And um, passed an act in February 4th, on February 4th, 1791, approving the petition to admit Kentucky to the Union. Of course, we officially became a state in 1792. Um, so the second thing in the collection is this congressional journal owned by John Brown. And we have several of these and actually quite a few of them are rare, rare books. Um, this one was owned by John Brown and it contains um, an appendix with the proceedings of the District of Kentucky admission to the Union. Um, so John Brown really, he signed this in this really special way, he dated it. And um, I think that it was important to him and it was a historic, journal so he made the, he never usually did this much flourish with his signature so i think it meant something to him so then as a member of the u.s congress in its formative years brown also participated in developing america's new government um, we have a really cool pocket copy it's a small thing of um, the u.s constitution that was john brown's and of course the constitution was created in 1787 and ratified in 1788. And this is the time when Brown was a member of the Con Confederation Congress. He did support a federal, strong federal government. However, most of the Kentuckians did not. Um, but this constitution is actually kind of notable for its binding. Um, there's all these blank pages woven throughout. Although um, it, I guess for the whoever owned its notes, but John Brown didn't write in it. So they're just blank on this one, but it's still cool. Another really cool thing we have is this paper bound pamphlet. It has um, 40 Senate rules. It's the rules for the Senate. So we had this when he was the US Senator. And um, today's Senate is governed by a Senate manual with 43 rules, standing rules. So not too many more. Um, and this one is a very rare book. Um, I don't think there's just a few copies known to exist. It's in its original blue wrappers. It's really, uh, it's really cool little thing. And it's, I think it's also these, this binding is the original binding, so it's neat. So turning to more of like domestic books, um, an interesting manuscript in the collection um, owned by John Brown was his commonplace book. And a commonplace book was kind of like a scrapbook filled with knowledge, advice, even poetry. It's kind of has multiple topics over multiple sources from multiple sources. And this one actually contains six, 261 pages, chock full of recipes, um, remedies, household solutions, um, agriculture and fishing tips, weaponry making tips, newspaper clippings. And you see, this is a picture of the index. So he's got you know everything in here. 
Um, and there's an eggnog recipe that we've used before or we've adapted before in our Christmas program. Um, so you can see it's over these dates, 1810 and 1834. I'm just gonna show you a few other things because they're kind of interesting. So this is an influenza cure from 1818. And see, so he's copied this from a doctor, Dr. I think it might be Joseph Scott. Um, one of the rest things in this is um, Seneca snake root is one of the things that's a cure. Um, another thing, I just pulled a few of these. This is to, how to dye your hair. And um, this contains strong ale, soot, and walnut leaves. And then this one over here is cockroach extermination. I know. And this one, it, it says basically, it's from a New York magazine. And it basically says, just put some molasses and water down and they'll be gone. I don't, I don't think that would have worked. But um, they're just kind of, there's this thing is chock full of stuff. It's very interesting. Um, another book that um, is kind of domestic, I think of as domestic is how to build an ice house. And we know that the Browns had an ice house on the grounds of Liberty Hall prior to 1820, but um, we don't know where it was. And this is just one from Ashland, just to get Ashland Henry Clay estate to see what they would have maybe looked like. Um, so this book could have provided the instructions for that. Um, an interesting side note about this book is that um, its author, Thomas Moore, he was a Maryland farmer who developed one of the earliest refrigeration devices. So this book has the ice house construction, and he also describes the newly invented machine, the refrigerator. Um, I think it was just like an ice chest. And um, so John Brown owned this book, and also Thomas Jefferson owned the same book, apparently, and he um, purchased one of these refrigerators, Jefferson did in 1804, and, and Jefferson and Brown were, were friends and, and colleagues. So uh, it's just kind of interesting to learn about that one. So that one could be rare, I don't know. Um, now I'm gonna turn to a few of Margareta Mason Brown's books, and she's about 18 or 19 in this portrait, and she's still living in New York City. She hasn't moved to Kentucky yet. She was really quite highly educated, very well-read woman. Um, she attended a school in New York run by Isabella Graham. Um, and so when Margareta moved to Frankfurt, it is not surprising that she, she brought several books with her and she acquired more after she came. And in a letter to a friend, she wrote, she wrote, I have been furnished with a very excellent library. And that, that's from 1804, I think. Um, but in a, the, prior to moving to Kentucky in the 1790s, um, she kept uh, these reading lists. And I'm gonna just show you a few that she had on her, we call it the pre-marriage library list. Um, this is a French book, um, The Adventures of Telemachus. I always get that messed up. Telemachus, right? That seems good. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, Martha yeah, Martha can tell us. This one is from 1791. And um, as I said, Margareta read French. She inscribed this um, book in both her maiden and her married names. It's also signed by her brother, John Mitchell Mason. And he probably owned this book before he, he gave it to his younger sister. Um, and a, in the early 19th century, they were very, books were very highly valuable and ownership was often transferred through gifts and wills. And this book uh, has a very nice binding and you can see the home, home, um, huh, handmade marbled end papers. So this probably would have been a pretty expensive book at the time of purchase. So another book owned by her is called The Botanic Garden. And this book is written by Erasmus Darwin. That's the grandfather of Charles Darwin. And he was, Erasmus was a physician, but he was also a philosopher and a poet. And this book contains the poem called The Loves of the Plants. And it was actually a pretty popular science book at the time, but it was also considered kind of racy. Um, it illustrates Linnaeus's classification scheme of plants and Linnaeus had proposed that like humans, plants are male and female and reproduce sexually. So that's the racy part. Um, but this one is really, has some really great illustrations. It's a really cool little interesting book too. Also given to her by her brother, John Mitchell Mason. And then this book is an astronomy book um, that the author Isaac Watts, he was an English minister and this was actually published, published originally in 1736, our copy is from 1782. And Watts felt that by studying nature, people could better understand God. 
Um, so he really advocated for the study of the heavens, um, for kids to study that in order to solidify their Christian beliefs. This one has some really neat pullouts um, and maps and diagrams. Um, so it's a pretty cool book. And it's also a book that her brother gave her. And this little beautifully handwritten inscription says, to Miss Margaret Mason, this copy of Watts Astronomy is presented as a pledge of affection with every wish for her improvement and useful and polite knowledge by her brother, John Mitchell Mason. And this is John Mitchell here. And this was uh, given to her in 1791. Okay, what else do we have here? Okay, so we already discussed a poetry book owned by Margareta. And as I think I said before, she was a poet. She had a deep interest in poetry and prose. This quote here on the left says, for though I am passionately attached to poetry, I am feeling alive to the beauties of prose. This is one of the, my favorite things in our collection. Um, it's her, it's Margareta's commonplace book and um, that she entitled Fugitive P Piece Pieces or Juvenile Essays. And this is a little different than John's commonplace book because this just has poetry in it. Um, it contains 52 poems that she either wrote or copied from magazines or newspapers. And she titled it A Piece of Juvenalia or A Work of a Young Person. And she began writing in this when she was 13 and she continued it for 22 years. Um, so in the book, there's, there's all kinds of different things, but there are a few that are just about her children. And this one here, there's two, two I think. And this one's called Lines Addressed to Mason in Orlando in 1802. And it starts, the first line is health to my babes. Um, and so this other one is called Addressed to a Cold from 1797. And this one's kind of funny, it's pretty humorous. But she says the beginning, tell me you sly maneuvering foe. So we know that she wrote these because they're pretty personal. Um, but she had these two examples she did not write. And um, this first one, she annotated, she would like see this little asterisk up here. This says DA, this is one she copied from a magazine and it's the Daily Advertiser, Political, Historical and Commercial. This is an early New York magazine that included poetry. Um, and so this, you know, it was 1786, it's three years after the end of the Revolutionary War. So, um, She's got two in here from the 4th of July, about the 4th of July. So this other one is from the New York Magazine, um, New York Magazine or Literary Repository. And that was a one that was around in the 1790s. So, so yeah, these she definitely copied in, but they must have been important to her. And then in 1819, Margareta became the first superintendent of a Presbyterian Sunday school for girls in Frankfurt. And she served as its treasurer. She was also a teacher. Um, her father was a Presbyterian minister um, and so was John Mitchell Mason, her brother. And John Brown's father was also a Presbyterian minister. So they had a lot of that in common. They both came from religious households. They both were religious um, and early Sunday schools met at fellow teacher and neighbor Elizabeth Love's home or on the Liberty Hall Gardens and, and in the house. And on the left here is something, um, it's called Food for Lambs. It's a dictionary of religious terms. It was, this one was published in Frankfurt by A. Kendall and Company in 1824. And um, it does just say by one of their teachers, but we believe it was Margareta. And then over here is a pocket dictionary of the Holy Bible. You can see her name up here, October 1831. And so uh, that's just one of the Bibles, one of the many Bibles we have in the collection. Let's see here. One of the questions I've had before is, did Margareta read Jane Austen? And you know, she's the right time period for Jane Austen. And um, we do have a set of Jane Austen's books in the collection, but it's much later. It's for, they're from 1885. And um, one of Margareta's um, friends asked that same question in this letter that I'm going to read. Um, she says, have you read the works of Jane Austen? They are very different from those of Miss Edgeworth, but in their own style, most admirable, presenting perfect pictures of daily hourly experience of characters and manners in real life. You will derive, derive pleasure from them if they happen to suit your taste. I say if, for they are not universally appreciated. So, um, that kind of reveals that Margareta liked Mariah Edgeworth, who was an English writer who wrote books for children and adults. 
Um, and she's a contemporary of Jane Austen. And it makes sense that Margareta liked Edgeworth because we have several of Edgeworth's books in our collection. One of them, um, there's Mariah, and one of them is this book. I actually just figured out that this was Margareta's. There's her handwriting. There's like a, I can't remember what it was, but there's a bunch of her handwriting in the back of this book. Um, but this was called, uh, this is the Modern Griselda. It's first published in 1804. It deals with ideals of womanhood and gender equality. And it's based off the popular figure from folklore, Griselda who was noted for being patient and obedient. But in this book, um, the character of Griselda kind of flips that role and she wants to dominate her husband. But then there's another character that's kind of a heroine in the book who kind of has an uh, equal relationship with her husband, which is her name was Emma. So um, I think this is interesting. It seems like a pretty modern book um, for women from in the early 19th century. And actually Jane Austen was a big admirer of Edgeworth's. And apparently Austin sent one of her first printed copies of her book, Emma, to Mariah, but the feeling wasn't mutual. Um, Mariah did not care for Austin. So anyway, pretty interesting, but we still don't know if Margareta read Austin. Um, and this is a, one of the children's books in the collection from Edgeworth, that, I mean, that Edgeworth wrote. Um, and children's books in this period are really instructive. They taught moral lessons. They had very few illustrations of any. So very, very different from what we have today for a children's book. Um, but this book, Frank Part Two, does have a few things that make it friendly to a child. Um, it's small in size. I can't really tell from that picture, but it's about three inches by five. So it could be held in a child's hand. The print is actually pretty big too. Um, this is supposed to be bigger. It it's, doesn't look that big, but it, um, a little bit bigger than some books to appeal to a child. And um, Edgeworth's uh, children's stories are almost always aimed to uh, teach a moral lesson as this one does. And the, this boy in this book, Frank, Vicki just told me this because she's read part of it, um, has lots of adventures, but he makes a lot of mistakes and he's corrected by his mother. Um, and you can see the inscriptions on this one, Orlando Brown from his affectionate mother, Margareta Brown, M. Brown. And it was also owned by um, his little sister, Euphemia, Euphemia H. Browns, 1814. Um, this date is a significant date because poor little Euphemia died in 1814. She was only seven years old. Um, so, you know, that's why I only showed you Orlando and Mason. So she didn't, the, on, the only daughter of the Browns didn't make it. Um, so it's kind of neat to have her name in that book. Um, also, there's notes in this book that Orlando, who was 11 years old at the time, read this book in 11 days in 1812. <coughs> now, here's one that um, Jim Birchfield, just, who's tuning in tonight, uh, did a blog about. So, um, but this one was also um, printed in Frankfort, Kentucky. It's called Kentucky A Poem by Isaac Skinner. It was, pred, it was um, 1821. And the author who was not a Kentuckian really glowingly describes the state's landscapes and he praises uh, different frontiersmen who founded and fought for the state. It's a 36 page book. It's a rare book. There are only four known copies to exist. Um, and the paper, um, the book was printed on may have been produced in Franklin County by Ebenezer Stedman, who owned a paper mill on the Kentucky River at Stedman Town, not far from Frankfurt. So that's kind of cool. And then jumping ahead to the late 19th century, um, we have a nice collection of poems by Robert Burns Wilson. He's best known for his paintings of Kentucky landscapes, but he also wrote poetry. And he was originally from Pennsylvania, but moved to Frankfurt in 1875. Um, he lived there for about 30 years or so. And Wilson was a close friend of Mary Mason, Ma Mary Mason Scott, who she was, she went by Maine, who I mentioned earlier, who was the last resident of Liberty Hall. And several of Wilson's paintings, poetry books, and original manuscript, manuscripts, um, we have four sonnets that he gave to Maine on her birthday are in the collection. And this is one of them right here that he gave her birthday was April 5th, 1899. You can see it down here. And he illustrated this one really nicely. Um, this also expresses that some of the themes of his poetry, which we just learned about um, by another Zoom talk by Beth Carter, that he, he 
it's a lot of his poetry is about nature and unrequited love and this is what this is um but he it seemed like he was interested in Mame romantically but um um Mame never married and and he he moved and moved on he moved on and moved to new york and married someone else but um we also have in our um we have two of his books a poetry books in the collection and this one here the shadow of the trees i think is what it's called here hold on let's see is that what it's called the shadow of the trees yes um he gave her this one i think this one is inscribed to, to maine okay i'm going to turn it over to vicky now we're in kate's study <clears throat> so that's why we're we're switching chairs <clears throat> And I apologize, I'm having some allergy problems, so hopefully all will go well. I'm just going to tell you about a few of the really interesting um, types of books that are in the library, sort of by the type of book instead of by the owner of the book. And the first is garden books. Um, I think it sounds like everybody who's watching knows about Liberty Hall's garden, which is one of our most popular features in, in addition to the historic houses, about four acres. and between the letters that we have from the Brown family and their books and manuscripts, we believe that the Browns were really interested in gardening. Um, Kate mentioned the Stepney family, so we do want to acknowledge that the Browns themselves were probably not the primary gardeners. Um, for the first two generations, it was probably enslaved members of the household. And later we know that there were um, a couple of other um, employed gardeners. But it does appear that some of them did some gardening. So these are some examples of their garden books. On the um, over here on the left is the American Gardener's Calendar. This um, edition was published in 1839 and inscribed by Mary Yoder Brown. Uh, she was the second wife of Mason Brown, and they became the second owners of Liberty Hall when John and Margareta died. This book is divided up by month and it tells you what to plant and how to take care of it. And you can see over there, kitchen gardens, fruit gardens, orchard, vineyard, nursery, et cetera, et cetera. It's pretty, um, pretty comprehensive in its scope. Um, in the middle is a um, page from a manuscript, a commonplace book that Mary Yoder Brown Scott kept. So she was Mary Yoder Brown's daughter and became the third owner of Liberty Hall. And she most definitely was interested in gardening because she had a whole journal into which she copied little tidbits of advice about, for the most part, flowers and vegetables, how and when to plant them, how to grow them, and how to get rid of the pests <laughs> that bothered them. I like this page um, about flowers blooming in May because it lists several types of flowers that still bloom in our garden, columbine, lily of the valley, poppies, and snowdrops. And then it also has these little scraps of uh, rustic bridges pasted in uh, to the bottom of the page. On the right um, is an illustration from a wildflower book that just has beautiful color illustrations. And it's not inscribed by a Brown family member, but may have belonged to Mary Mason Scott, who was interested in uh, planting wildflowers on the riverbank uh, behind Liberty Hall and, and went to some uh, trouble to, to acquire some. This is bee balm, and we do have bee balm growing in our garden now, a little bit later this summer, but uh, now we've got it there for the, for the pollinators. Our next category is cookbooks, and um, you're probably not surprised that, that we have some cookbooks, a couple shelves worth. Um, we're actually fortunate to have manuscript cookbooks, basically commonplace books that have recipes copied into them representing um, three generations of Brown family members. Kate mentioned John's commonplace book a little earlier, and I think John Brown was a foodie. There are many, many interesting recipes in his commonplace book, but this one, which is kind of an interesting oblong shape and is just just about that size, a little bit smaller, was um, a recipe book that Margareta Brown assembled. Some of them are written sideways like this and some of them are written kind of the long way um, in the booklet. And this recipe for election cake is especially interesting because it's an American recipe. Um, and she probably, it looks like she copied it almost verbatim from a really popular cookbook of the era 
the American frugal housewife. Um, to the right of the election cake is Margareta's copy of Domestic French Cookery. This was um, written, actually translated by Eliza Leslie, who was a very popular writer of cookbooks and housekeeping books and even child rearing books. And we've got several of her books owned by various generations of the Brown family, but this one really is a, um, an illustration of Margareta's interest in French. Kate mentioned all those French books that we had that, um, that were hers or may have been acquired for her. On the left, uh, this is the latest of the three. Um, and this is an illustration okay. from Isabella Beaton's Book of Household Management. Uh, this is kind of the joy of cooking of, um, of England. Uh, and I think it was first published in 1860. And English cooks continued to use it into the uh, 20th century. And Mary Yoder Brown Scott, the third owner of Liberty Hall owned this copy, which has wonderful color illustrations. <clears throat> Music books are another great category. And I'm starting to think that the Browns were a pretty musical family. Um, we have hymn books from all four generations of Brown family members um, who lived in Liberty Hall. And we also have many, many pieces of sheet music. Uh, some of those probably belong to Mary Mason Scott. Um, there's a photograph of Liberty Hall early, a room early in the 20th century, and there's a big upright piano in it. And Annie Hord Brown, who was Orlando Brown's granddaughter, one of them, and one of the last Brown family members to live in the Orlando Brown house, um, played the organ in the Frankfurt Presbyterian Church, and I think in the Episcopal Church too. Um, so we've got some of her church music as well. This uh, on the right, uh, the title page and this hymn from the Lexington cabinet, I think are um, part of a fairly rare shape note songbook that was inscribed by Mary Yoder Brown, again, Mason's second wife. Um, when Mason married um, Mary, uh, his first wife had died and it took him a long time to, to remarry. And, and Margareta wrote in a letter that um, Mary Yoder Brown wasn't much to look at, but she was intelligent and, and well-to-do and most of all, extremely pious. And those were important things to Margareta. Um, the Lexington cab cabinet was assembled in Lexington and it's um, shape note songs from various sources. It was published in Louisville in 1831. Um, shape note uh, singing was a system of learning to read music by associating geometric shapes with notes in the scale. And an account book we have uh, that belonged to Margareta has a couple notations about sending, paying for someone to go to singing school. So they might've been using a book like this one. On the, on the left side of uh, the screen is this little book of Christmas carols, which was um, gifted to a Brown family member early in the 20th century, probably Mary Mason Scott, but we're not sure. And um, I included it because it's an example of a book that's actually really pretty. And a lot of the books in our collection um, can be considered works of art. Then we have all the miscellaneous things which make up um, a lot of uh, the treasures that we are still discovering. Um, these are all things that kind of illustrate Brown family members in other places. Um, the middle page is from a um, kind of an autograph album uh, of poems that were written on Mary Yoder's behalf when she was in the Lafayette Academy in Lexington. You can see that date there, August 15th, 1826. So this is before she met Mason, but a number of her books have survived in our library. And you can see, um, I don't know if this is an original poem by the writer or something that he copied, but every page in the book has something like this, beautiful handwriting and all sorts of calligraphic flourishes. And we just discovered this, um, you know, in the last few months. Over here on the left um, is a, a guide to Paris with a great map inside that was kind of pasted into a um, travel journal that Mary Mason Scott kept. 
Um, she had traveled to Europe with her aunt and uncle, Eliza and Joe Bailey, and you can see their name up here on the top of the guidebook. And unfortunately, she didn't uh, finish that travel journal. She kept it for um, a few weeks, I think, and then um, gave up. But it does have lots of great little tidbits like that in it. Then over here on the right, um, this is Mary Mason Scott's brother, John Matthew Scott. And he attended Princeton, um, which was a, a popular school in the Brown family. And uh, this is a Thanksgiving dinner program um, by a men's club uh, that he evidently belonged to. And you can see uh, that the people who attended the dinner signed the program. So we feel really lucky to have this and probably need to let Princeton know that we've got it. And then getting a little closer to home, um, it's not that easy to see, but the account book or ledger on the left belonged to Preston Brown. He was one of John Brown's younger brothers and he practiced medicine in uh, uh, Franklin County and in Woodford County. And this, uh, this is the first page of it. So it starts in 1809 and goes through at least 1811. And it lists the names of his patients and the treatments that he prescribed and, and what he charged them. So this is a nice piece of um, medical history that has yet to be transcribed. Interestingly, at the very end of this book, is a page that says Preston Brown's slaves and lists the enslaved people who were working on a farm in Woodford County that Preston helped to manage in 1811. Um, in the middle there is a, um, a recipe that we found in one of the handwritten cookbooks, but you can see it's written on a, a prescription, a piece, a piece of paper from, I guess, a prescription pad from the Averill um, apothecary in downtown Frankfurt. I think it might have been for cough syrup because you can see it's got some um, herbs and uh, things like that, but also some hard cider and you let it sit around for a few days and then dose yourself with it. And then finally, um, when Frankfurt celebrated its centennial in 1886, John Mason Brown, who was one of John and Margareta Brown's grandsons, gave the address. And uh, this is a published uh, version of that address. And I've never tried to time it, but I think it might have been a two or two and a half hour lecture about Frankfurt's history um, that John Mason Brown put together. I'm going to turn it back to Kate and she's going to do a little bit of summary. And then if there are any questions, we'll try to answer them. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to show you just, we have uh, some of these online and um, if you, you can find this on our website and like here are the different things. You can look at objects too as well, but archives, photos, libraries, these are the things you would hit to see um, some of the stuff we have online um, or you can also call me for an appointment if you wanted to do research. Uh, we also have an adopt a book program. This is also on our website. So um, that's something you might consider too. Um, so we just wanted to let you know about those. And so that's that's all we have. Um, if anybody has questions, Diane. I can all take right. this down if you like. Um, if you have a question, uh, feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask. Or if you would prefer, you can, of course, put uh, your question in the um, in the chat. Thank you so much, Kate and Vicki. That was super well, informative. And a lot of information, I know. It, it's, it's a lot of stuff, and that's just a little bit. <laughs> There's so much stuff there in our library. And the, the library has really helped us to enrich our tours. Um, actually, when Becky was giving tours for us, she was already pulling things from the library and, yeah. and also our programs. It's a great, great resource to have in a museum because it gives you so much insight into yeah. the daily lives of the people who live in the house. Um, you, you mentioned that one of those um, items in the miscellaneous um, sort of section that you, you only found maybe a couple months ago. Um, what is that like uh, when, when you stumble upon a treasure like that? I mean, 
that has to be super exciting. I mean, can you talk a little bit about that and what you do, what the process is from there? Well, the process is, I mean, it's really cool, but it's, it's a little bit overwhelming, to be honest, because we're like, oh my gosh, there's like piles of these things. I mean, Vicki has two boxes that she wants, or there's more than two, a uh, few that we can't, we just haven't had time to catalog it or even inventory it. So um, I'm working on the object collection right now, which is another thing. So um, we've done a lot with the library, but there's still more to do. So it's kind of, it's exciting, but it's also kind of overwhelming, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think there was a day when I was waiting for a preschool to show up and it was a rainy day and I didn't know if they were going to come or not. So I started looking at a box. This was several years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's just unbelievable, you know, mm -hmm. what's in them. And then sometimes we're going back thinking that we saw that in one of these boxes, yeah. where is it? And then we Thank discover you know. something else. And like, that's where Mary Yoder's album showed up. We were looking for something else and there was that little treasure. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 um, it's, it's amazing how much stuff there is. And it's amazing, like the family kept so much of it. And, yeah, you know, so it's really, really cool. We'll get, you know. Something, yeah, we'll get there. Martha? <coughs> Hi, um, thank you so much. That was so interesting. I, um, I've studied a lot of French literature of, um, you know, early modern France. And um, I know a little bit about Fenelon who wrote um, Telemachus, The Adventures of okay. Telemachus. Yeah. Um, yeah. Every library um, in the 17th century, serious library would have had a copy of this text. It was, um, Fenelon was, um, he was a tutor. He was the tutor for the sons of the Duke of Burgundy. And um, he wrote this as kind of his textbook. And um, it had a lot of historical and moral kinds of lessons. And it was really used to teach the grandsons of Louis the 14th. But what is interesting, because you were talking about maps, is that in later editions, if I remember from grad school days, but later editions, and it was hugely popular. It was a bestseller and, oh, um, really? and for like two centuries. And yeah. um, what was interesting is in later editions, they added a map in the front part. Uh, so it was like a reference book for mythology book. and geography and history. And um, they added a map of the Mediterranean. So um, if you were interested in the geography of yeah. that area, because Telemachus was the son of Odysseus, so he traveled all right. around the Mediterranean, right? So um, this map was much sought after um, yeah. by people who wanted to know yeah. that part of the world. Anyway, just a little footnote on Fenelon cool. and uh, Telemachus. Yeah, that's the one. I can never say that, right? I'm always like, Telemachus, what is it? <laughs> how, you nailed how it. it how would you say it in french how would you pronounce it uh it was telemac telemac, telemac. Mm -hmm. telemac. okay good to know yeah that's yeah but it it was it's, why it was so popular and so widely widely read this family mm -hmm. yeah yeah that is really cool any other questions or comments um, what would you say, um, I'll, I'll ask both of you so you can each give us an answer. Um, what is your favorite uh, item in the collection and why? Well, I, 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 I said that I, I like Margareta's poetry book. I just think, I don't know. To me, it's just, it's so personal. And, um, you know, she's written for 22 years in it or whatever I said. And I don't know, to think like she picked that thing up you know, and wrote in it whatever poems she liked or her own poems, which don't really translate today that well, but it's still, you know, it's just, I don't know. There's just something about that that I really like. So. Um, I love John Brown's commonplace <laughs> yeah, book. Yeah. Um, we, we thought it was, when I first started working there, we thought it was Margaretta's mm -hmm. and, you know, started incorporating things from it into the tour. And then Kate looked harder at it one day and said, this is John's. But, well, that, handwriting. Explains, that explains why there's a big section about fishing and why there's a big section about how to outfit a soldier for the Indian Wars. 
you know, that oh, he's, yeah. he's copying down various stuff from his friends. So I think it gives you a great insight into mm -hmm. John Brown, who, you know, we tend to focus on his political career because that's sort of what makes him significant in early Kentucky. But you see this great human side of him by looking at the stuff he copied down. Yeah, true. Yeah, we and also I think Vicki said that that commonplace could it could be a thesis. I mean, it's just so full of it's stuff. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. it's two hundred and sixty pages. Yeah. So. Yeah, I like to think of him sitting in the library at the old Capitol, if it was there, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and reading newspapers from Massachusetts, you know, and copying <laughs> stuff down, yeah. you know, that caught his eye. Mm-hmm. Does anybody else have any questions? We should tell Kate Mulhern that there is a photograph in the collection of a ginger cat mm -hmm. um, sitting on the back steps of Liberty Hall and the caption says it's the Princeton Tiger. Yeah. So <laughs> that's like, that might be our only cat picture, but we- Yeah, need... yeah, and it's funny, yeah, yeah. So we know John Matthew went there and a few of the other but it was probably his. It's and then probably... the painting. Yes, that's right. The painting. Yeah. There's also the, the painting um, of that ginger cat on, of um, in front of Liberty Hall, the, like that little step there on the porch, on the front porch. Well, I'm sure that Buddy would be glad to came, claim that cat as his kin. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, if nobody has any more questions before we wrap up tonight, ladies, would you mind to um, just remind everyone um, if they're interested in coming in um, to take a tour or to take a look at the items in the library, um, how they could do that? Um, yeah, so as I said, if you if you want to just see the library in general, um, you just come on a tour. They're from 11, they're, at, they're Monday through Saturday um 11 30 or 1 30 and you have to sign up online on our website um and um and they will see the library and the tour guide will take you up there but if you want to do research of course you just have to call me so call up call our you know call up at liberty hall so all right well thank you so very much kate and vicky you're welcome this was so interesting um and we did uh, record tonight so um, if you are um, on the call tonight and you've enjoyed it and want to share um, it with your friends or family members who weren't able to join us, it will be archived um, uh, probably in the next day or so on the PSPL Facebook page and our YouTube page so we can have as many people enjoy it as possible. But I'd like to thank all of our participants tonight for joining us. Thank you again. Um, Vicki and Kate um, and everybody at Liberty Hall and uh, wish you all well and uh, you're very good neighbors to us and we uh, enjoy partnering with you any anytime we can um, and I hope everybody is able to get out and, and enjoy some of the treasures we have here um, in, in Frankfurt but especially downtown Frankfurt um, right right in our backyard so thank you again and we hope to see you all soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.